Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and you are watching Spirit Church on the Encounter TV Network. I'm here at Hungry Generation in Pasco, Washington. We're actually on the road right now, so this is where we're recording it, so it's going to be a little bit different. I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit, more specifically, the Holy Spirit in every book of the Bible. That's what you're going to hear today. I'm going to show you the Holy Spirit in the Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and I know it's going to bless your life, and it's going to stir a hunger in you for the things of the Holy Spirit. But first, with me as usual, Stephen Moctezuma. He's going to lead you in some very anointed worship, and then we're going to get right into this session, again, that I recorded at Hungry Generation Church in Pasco, Washington. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. Fire Fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. Fire, fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. Fire, fall down. Fire, fall down on us, we pray. Fire, fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. Fire, fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. As we seek you, fire, fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. As we seek you, fire. Fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. Oh, fire, fall down, fire, fall down on us, we pray. Fire, fall down. Fire, fall down on us, we pray. So I want to show you in the Bible in every book of the Bible, the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have another teaching that's on my channel that really details how you would find the Holy Spirit in every book of the Bible. There's the subtle mention, there's the specific mention, there's the symbolic mention. But I want to just get into really the references where we find the Holy Spirit. So just as a quick recap, for those of you who weren't able to watch that, the specific mention is like what we read in the first session. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's very, very specific. A subtle mention is like what we see in Isaiah chapter 6. Turn there for a second. Isaiah chapter 6. This is going to be something that maybe you've seen before, but I didn't see it at first, so I thought it was interesting. But here in Isaiah chapter 6... Isaiah the prophet has an encounter with God. He is able to see the train of his robe filling the temple with glory. He's shaken to his core. He knows that he's catching a glimpse of heaven. And what's interesting to me is that the scripture tells us in Isaiah 6 that it was the Lord or it was God who was talking to the prophet. We know this from the scripture. Isaiah chapter 6, let's go to verse number 9. 
And he said, yes, go and say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people, plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. Then I said, Lord, how long will this go on? That was verse 11. So he's talking to the Lord. He's talking to God. But now let's go to Acts, the very last chapter of Acts, which I believe is chapter 28. Go to Acts chapter 28. And let's go down now to verse 25. So look up at me for a second. We're going to be in Acts 28, 25. We just read in the book of Isaiah that it was God talking to Isaiah. It was the Lord talking to Isaiah. But in fact, we get more clarity here in Acts chapter 28, verse 25, where the scripture says, and after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. Here, the scripture tells us that it was actually the Holy Spirit speaking to Isaiah the prophet. And this just clarified that. So that would be a subtle mention of the Holy Spirit in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. So Isaiah chapter 6 is actually talking about the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't know it unless you studied it out all the way to Acts chapter 28. So that's a subtle mention of the Holy Spirit. So again, there's the specific mention of the Holy Spirit. That's where you see him outright mentioned in the scripture. There's the subtle mention, which is like what we just read. And then there is the symbolic mention. Now, some of the symbols of the Holy Spirit include fire, wind, the cloud, light, oil, um, there is the seal, not like the sea creature, but the stamp. And I could go on. That's an entirely different lesson in itself. But the symbols of the Holy Spirit, such as oil, such as fire, such as water, such as the dove, actually give us insight into the nature of the Holy Spirit all throughout Scripture. So looking at those three ways that we find the Holy Spirit, the specific mention, the subtle mention, and the, the symbolic mention, we can actually go through the scripture and find the Holy Spirit in every single book of the Bible. Are you ready? I'm going to show it to you right now. So we see the spirit of creation in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 where he hovered above the face of the deep. We see that the Holy Spirit is the name changer in Genesis chapter 17 verse 5. Abraham's name was changed to Abraham. In other words, God breathed the breath, that Ruach or Ruach HaKodesh, which means wind, spirit, or breath. That was the spirit placed into Abraham. It's when he received the Holy Spirit and his name was changed and his nature was changed. So the Holy Spirit is the name changer. Genesis chapter 17 verse 5. Genesis chapter 41 verse 38 tells us that he was the spirit within Joseph. In other words, he's the spirit of the dreamer. Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. We see that the Holy Spirit, through the symbol of fire, comes to encounter Moses at a burning bush. He gave Moses a burning heart for the lost. He is the fire of evangelism in Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. He's the precious oil in Exodus chapter 30 verses 22 through 25. He's the expert spirit in Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. He's the sovereign fire in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. What's interesting about that portion of scripture in Leviticus 9 is that that was actually the first time that the altar had been lit with fire. God instructs the, the priest to build the altar, and it's the first time they're carrying out their priestly duties in these chapters of the Bible, Leviticus 8 and 9 where they are actually being given instructions on how to carry out their priestly duties. They had never done it before. The Levitical law had just been established. The priesthood had just been established. And at the first sacrifice, God tells them to keep the fire burning. He tells them, never let the fire go out. But never once does God tell the priest to actually light the fire. Instead, the scripture says that a fire comes out from the presence of the Lord, and it consumed the gift on the altar. The fire came from the presence of God. In other words, you cannot start a move of God by the efforts of man. It's by the Spirit alone. You cannot start the fire, but you can steward the fire. You cannot cause the fire to come into being, but you can keep the fire burning based upon how you treat that fire that God has given to you. So I call him the sovereign fire 
because this is basically descriptive of how the Holy Spirit moves. In other words, he moves at his own free will. He moves at his own pace. Man can do nothing to cause a move of God except for do what God tells him to do. And in so doing, he's actually doing God's will. So therefore, God is the one who starts the fires of revival. And this is why Nadab and Abihu, by the way, were destroyed when they offered strange fire before the Lord because they had brought a fire that was built by man or that was started by man. And it wasn't the fire that came out from the presence of God. So therefore, they tried to do in the flesh what could only be done in the spirit and they were destroyed for it. So that's the sovereign fire, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. And I really do wish I could stop at each one of these. I'll only stop at a few key points just for the sake of time because I do want to get to your questions. Um, but let's continue here. He's the pure oil in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 2. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 tells us of how Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, oil is a symbol, an Old Testament reference to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not in every reference, but in many references. He's the spirit of impartation in Numbers chapter 11, verse 17. The scripture says, and I will put the spirit upon them also. The spirit of impartation. Impartation comes not when I'm related by family, not when I'm given seniority because I've been there for a long time, not because of my own efforts, not because of favoritism or connections. Impartation comes by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit decides where the mantles fall. He's the different spirit that was within Caleb. That's Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. He was the spirit in Joshua, Numbers 27, 18. He was the fire by night and the cloud by day in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 33. This speaks to the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Fire and the cloud, those are both symbols of the Holy Spirit. He's the oil of prosperity in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 24. He's the spirit of breakthrough in Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. You notice that the children of Israel were not given some military strategy to overcome the walls of Jericho. The children of Israel were not given some powerful weapon, nor were they given any natural means to causing those walls to come down. They were simply told to march around the walls of Jericho and then release a shout. What was that shout? It was the breath. When they blew through the trumpets, it was the breath. It was the breath of breakthrough. I love that reference, I believe, in Psalms where David writes about how it was the, the blast of God's nostril that caused the waters to separate and stand up. In other words, it's the breath of God that caused the waters to stand up like walls and caused the walls to fall down like water. The breath of God is the breath of breakthrough. That's who the Holy Spirit is in Joshua. Again, Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. He's the spirit of discernment in Joshua 7, 16 through 19. Remember the story with Achan's tent where there was sin in the camp? It was the Holy Spirit who spoke to Joshua. He's the spirit of leadership in Judges chapter 3, verse 10. He's the fire from the rock in Judges chapter 6, verse 21. He's the spirit of conquest in Judges eleven twenty nine. He's the fire of heaven in Judges thirteen twenty. He's the spirit of supernatural strength in Judges chapter 14, verse 6. By the way, you can all have a copy of this after. I see you writing notes ferociously, and I'll make sure to also give this to those for download who are watching online. And for those of you watching on Spirit Church, of course, we'll provide the download link on the YouTube description. Um, so, so I will give that to you. You still want to take notes? I'll, I'll give you the references and the titles. Take notes on everything else because those are not on the paper. I'm just doing that from memory. Okay, where was I? Oh, he's the spirit of supernatural strength in Judges chapter 14, verse 6. He's the gentle spirit in Judges chapter 16, verse 20. You realize that Samson did not realize the Lord had left him. When the Holy Spirit comes upon a life, he comes on loudly, but he leaves quietly. Quite the opposite of a demonic being who comes upon a life quietly, but leaves loudly. The Holy Spirit comes on like a mighty rushing wind, but he leaves as a whispered breath. He's the kind spirit of adoption in Ruth chapter 2, verse 21. And there are other symbols for the Holy Spirit in the book of Ruth, which I'm not detailing here. He's the appointing spirit in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, and in 1 Cham Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. He's the spirit who speaks through you in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. He's the still small voice in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. Scripture tells us that he was not in the wind, he was not in the earthquake, he was not in the fire. Why did God choose to speak to the still small voice and not the wind, the earthquake, or the fire? 
It's because the prophet had no choice. If, if God wanted to send a wind to blow him away, he could have blown him away. If God wanted to shake him up with an earthquake, he could have shaken him with an earthquake. If God wanted to burn him with the fire, he would have burned him with the fire. Instead, he chose to come to him in a still, small voice. Why? So that he could exercise his free will in response to that voice. He's the pervasive oil in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1-7. through 7. This is where the widow had jars and flasks that she was filling with oil. As soon as she ran out of jars, the oil stopped flowing. This is speaking to the nature of the Holy Spirit because He will only fill what is empty. As soon as you stop making room for Him, the oil stops flowing. He's the heavenly wind in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. He's a kindred spirit in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18. The approaching men prophesied, and therefore David knew that they were men who were kindred. He's the fortifying spirit in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Asa reminded Israel to rid themselves of idols, lest judgment come upon them again. He's the convicting spirit. We see that in Ezra chapter 10, verse 1. The people mourned when that spirit came upon them. He's the comforter in Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the prophet who helped to rebuild the walls. Nehemiah's name means the comforter. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives rebuilding our walls. He's the good spirit in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. He's the voice of destiny in Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. He's the life-giving spirit. In Job chapter 33, verse 4. He's the spirit of worship in Psalm chapter 51, verse 11. He's the oil of honor in Psalm 23, 5. He's the oil of joy in Psalm 45, 7. He's the oil of favor in Psalm 84, 9. He's the spirit of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. He's the spirit of purpose in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He's the hidden dove in Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 14. He's the generational spirit in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. He's the spirit upon Jesus in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. He's the fire in your bones in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. He's the one who grieves over sins in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 11. He's the life of the heavenly beings in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Now let me show you something here. This is one of my favorite um, portions here. I, I shouldn't say favorite. People ask me, what's your favorite scripture? I always tell them it depends on what day it is because I need different things on different days. But go now. To, I'm going to show you something here. You're going to love this. Eze Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, people often ask me, what does the Holy Spirit look like? I think one of the greatest um, references we can find is, I believe, Matthew chapter 3, where the Holy Spirit descends on him like uh, Jesus like a dove. And the, the Luke's gospel actually says that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form like a dove. In other words, something about his person when manifested in our realm looks like a dove. But let me show you something else. Go to Ezekiel chapter 8, beginning at, let's go to verse number 1. The scripture says, Then on September 17th, during the sixth year, while the leaders of Judah were in my home, the sovereign Lord took hold of me. Now watch this. I saw a figure that appeared to be a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he looked like a burning flame. From the waist up, he looked like gleaning, gleaming amber. He reached out with what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. Now look up at me. Don't keep reading. So here we see Ezekiel is describing a man of light and fire. He looks like a man, but, but, but he's, he's made of fire and light. And he grabs the prophet by the hair. Now watch this. Let's read that again. He reached out what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. Look at this. Then the Spirit lifted me up into the sky and transported me to Jerusalem in a vision from God. This may very well be a physical description of the Holy Spirit in the book of Ezekiel. The Holy Spirit is a man of fire. So, let's continue now. 
with the rest of the references here. So that's the fiery being in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. He's the giver of spiritual visions in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 24. He's the spirit of oneness in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. He's the excellent spirit in Daniel chapter 5, verse 12. He's the patient spirit in Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. He's the promise of the Father in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 31. He's the consuming fire in Amos chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. He's the vindicating fire in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 18. You see, he, he vindicated his people as a fire. He vindicated those he loved. The Holy Spirit will watch out for you. When people come against you, it's as if they're coming against the Holy Spirit himself. Think about what happened in the book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the apostle. What did he say to them? He said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because in lying to the apostle, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes it personal when people come against you, and he's the vindicating fire. He's the protector of the call in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. When Jonah disobeyed God and he was on the ship, tell me, not the whale, but what did God use to stop Jonah in his route going to disobedience? He sent a powerful wind. He did send a fish, yes. But he sent a powerful wind. A powerful wind came from the presence of God. That was the Holy Spirit correcting him. The same wind we read of in the book of Acts. He's the unchanging spirit. In Micah chapter 2 verse 7, the scripture asks, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? In other words, can you correct him? Can you cause him to change his mind? How many of us have tried to battle with the conviction of the Holy Spirit justifying ourselves? He tells us to stop doing something and we justify ourselves. He tells us to confess something and we justify ourselves. He tells us to go somewhere, do something, think a certain way, be a certain way, and we justify ourselves. And we find ourselves debating with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something, you're gonna lose that battle. The Holy Spirit can't be changed. You can't change his mind. The Holy Spirit is more patient than we are stubborn. He's the spirit of warning in Nahum chapter 1, verse 6. He will warn you before he will bring judgment, and he brings punishment on those whom he loves to help correct them. He's the spirit of indignation in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. He's the spirit of hope in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. He's the enemy of fear in Haggai chapter 2, verse 5. He's a wall of protection in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5. Someone once remarked to me, He's called the Holy Spirit, not the Grace Spirit. In other words, saying that he's, he's really a fiery, judgmental being, but it's not true because here in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, he's called the Spirit of Grace. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, he's called the Refiner's Fire. And now we're through the Old Testament. Are you still with me? Okay. Now we move into the New Testament. He's the Spirit of Incarnation in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. He's the spirit of the Father in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20. He's the spirit of deliverance in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. He's the beloved spirit in Mark chapter 3, verse 29. He's the omni-spirit, and I explain this in my book, um, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible. He's the omni-spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. He's the threshing wind in Luke chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. He's the spirit of salvation in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. He's the rivers of living water in John chapter 7, verses 38 through 39. He's the power of greater works in John chapter 14, verse 12. Let's actually go there. John 14, 12. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is important enough to, I mean, they're all very important, but this one I really think you should get. John chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. And then he gives us the reason why. So in other words, he's saying, if you believe in me, you're gonna do greater works than me. Well, why is that? He says right here, because I am going to be with my father. Now think about this for a second. Why was it that Jesus needed to be with his father in order for us to be able to do greater works. John chapter 16, verse 7 gives us the answer. 
But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate or another won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. In other words, Jesus was saying in John 14, 12, you'll be able to do greater works because I'll go to my Father. When I go to my Father, I'll send the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is the power for greater works. So that's John chapter 14, verse 12. I cross-referenced it with John chapter 16, verse 7. He's our helper in John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. He's the trusted spirit in John chapter 16, verse 7. Think about this. The father trusted the spirit to guide his son, Jesus. The son trusts the spirit to guide the church. Therefore, you should trust the spirit to guide your life. God the Father trusted the Holy Spirit with Jesus. Jesus trusts the Holy Spirit with us. Therefore, we should trust the Holy Spirit with our lives. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he's the spirit of power. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he's the spirit of boldness. Acts chapter 13, verse 4, he's the sender. Romans 5, 5, he's the one who loves Jesus or the one who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. Nobody on earth loves Jesus more than the Holy Spirit loves Jesus. And if you'll surrender to him, he'll enable you to love Jesus in the same way. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 and 14, he's the one who leads God's children. Romans chapter 8 verse 11, he's the resurrection spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 through 27, he's the mighty intercessor. The Holy Spirit prays for you through you if you just give him a voice. Romans chapter 15 verse 19, he's the giver of signs and wonders. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 10 to 12. He's the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. He's the Spirit of good judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. He's the mind of Christ. He's the transcending Spirit in 1 Corinthians 5, 3. He's the indwelling Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He's the gift giver in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He's the transforming Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. He's the spirit of faith in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. He's the Christ-like spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. He's the miracle-working spirit in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. He's the sustaining power in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where the scripture commands us to be filled. In the Greek, that word filled means be continually filled. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is both a one-time experience and a constant state of being. It's both a well and a river. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, he's the armor, spiritual armor bearer. He's the personal spirit in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. He's the spirit of love in Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. He's the delicate fire in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. He's the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. In other words, he's the one who holds back the end time events. If you read it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, you'll see the Antichrist cannot come so long as the restrainer is preventing that thing happening. And that is the Holy Spirit. He's the prophetic spirit in first, he's the prophetic spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He's the spirit of peace in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He's the giver of new life in Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. He's the spirit of forgiveness in Philemon chapter 1, verse 25. He is God in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. I can think of no better scripture to summarize the Trinity and the Holy Spirit's divinity than that scripture. I, I can elaborate on that for you later if you'd like. He's the jealous spirit in, chapter, in James chapter 4, verse 5. He's the oil of healing in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. He's the spirit of Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. He's the glorious spirit in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. He is also the breath of the scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. He's the witness of the incarnation in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 2. He's the masterful teacher in 2 John 1 through 3. He's the spirit of unity in 3 John 1, 1 through 3. He's the spirit of prayer in Jude chapter 1, verse 20. He's the revealer of Christ in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. And he is the sevenfold spirit in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. That, my friends, is the Holy Spirit in every book of the Bible. So I want to pray with you now. That's it for the lesson. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for revealing your word to us. And I pray that each 
individual receiving this prayer now would come to a place where they hunger and thirst after your word and your presence. Holy Spirit, we love you. And I pray you let us receive revelation of who you are. Let us walk closer with you daily, moment by moment. Let your presence touch us now. Let your power fill us again. Refresh us, Holy Spirit. And thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself through your word. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Well, I pray that you were blessed by that lesson. I know I was excited to teach it. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you and we are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you'd like information on how you can join the Spirit family, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. When you sign up, and again, it's absolutely free. When you sign up, you're going to receive a brand new teaching from me every single week, a fresh worship cover from Stephen Moctezuma, and the best part, you can reply to that email for prayer support from our ministry staff. Because we're on the road, we're not doing comments this week, but if you'd like me to potentially read your comment next week, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section now. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash encounter TV if you're not on YouTube. But subscribe today. There is tons of content there, worship the word, and much more. Now, I do want to talk to those of you who've yet to sign up to become our partner. Listen, if you've been blessed by this ministry, perhaps you've received the word, perhaps you've received breakthrough, perhaps you've received a greater understanding of the Holy Spirit, and you want to help us continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit through events and media, then sign up to be my partner today. Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. For those of you who will sign up for $30 or more a month, I will send you either Carriers of the Glory, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible, or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. I will sign that, send that to you. That will be my initiation gift. Just to say thank you for signing up to being my partner. Do that today if you've yet to do that. We also could use the one-time gifts. The one-time gifts are tremendous help. Help us spread the gospel. This is all about souls. Look, maybe you've been watching for the past few months. Maybe your life has been impacted. It's time that you step out. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, The generous soul shall prosper, and he who refreshes others shall himself be refreshed. When you refresh other ministries, God refreshes your ministry. When you give of your finances to help others financially, God brings finances your way. I believe that as you sow into this ministry, God is going to bring a season of refreshing to you. Maybe you're watching this and you've hit that wall and you can't quite get through and you're believing for breakthrough and it's not come yet. I believe that by you sowing into this ministry, which is anointed of God, you will be sowing in the right soil that will bring about a breakthrough. And that breakthrough comes not so you can consume it for yourself, but so that you can continue to be a blessing to others and the kingdom of God. So do that today. Make a one-time gift or become a monthly supporter. Do that right now. Help us take the gospel all around the world. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.